I am unashamed. What about you? All right, so welcome to Unashamed. Uh, I'm still at the Southern Lair. And I'm thinking, Dad, it's spring has sprung, as they say. Yep. And uh, we got some we got some guests coming in. So I've been I've been thinking about fish. You know, we've been talking about uh, the last podcast. We were talking about the miraculous um, fish. You know, we had the we had the kid with the what'd you call it, Jay's the kids' lunch because he had the, yeah. the two. <laughs> well, fish. he had he had five <laughs> small barley loaves. So these commentators they said, now this was the this was like the bottom of the bread aisle. This is the bakery clearance section because <laughs> the two key words there are small. Here's a boy with a five small barley loaves ooh, and two <laughs> small fish. Yeah. So well, with, the, with the barley, I would say every man for himself as far as trying to get some more barley loaves in here. But on the fish, I can prepare for a maneuver. I have a rope. It's a nylon rope. Nylon <laughs> material never rots. It never rots. So this rope goes down to the bottom of the river. It's on the bottom out there. One end of it it's, has a piece of concrete about this thick. Wide as this table right here. For those listening, it was about a foot wide. So, so you need a heavy piece of iron or a big slab of concrete. Well, you, you don't put the concrete down or the, or the heavy, heavy, heavy weight to hold your rope. All you have is a rope, but you're going to tie a net to it on one end. Well, the current's going to keep the net bloused out like that. So I can go over there if y'all want me to. Start. Uh, the reason I say start now is Opelousas catfish, which are the king for, as far as flavor goes. Catfish, he's number one, the best tasting one. Well, that Opelousas, his spawn time is during the month of May. So, yep. and that's a month away. So, we're right. getting close to the spawning time for that particular catfish, that particular fish. So I can go over there in the next two or three days, and I, I've got a little small drag, and I throw that drag out. I know where the rope is. It's been there for 50 years. <laughs> the rope <laughs> has been there for 50 years. It's on the bottom of the river, and the rednecks can't get to it because they don't know it's there. But I know where it's at. I know where it is. So I drag it up, and if I can't reach the river's been rising, so if you don't wait too late, it, you'll have to drag it up and just cut the rope, add on what you just cut, tied rope to it, let the rope, let the net go down. I, I, the reason I do that is because I'm on a run, like an interstate for fish. That Under net, the water. That net down there on the bottom, Opelousas are coming to that spot on their, on their migration. And I've picked it up before. Jace has been with me. It's where you, two men can't get the fish in the boat. There's too many fish. We pulled it up before, and there's a thousand pounds in that net. So I go with a little smaller net that'll hold four or five hundred pounds. Go over there. Sometime you have one Opelousas, but he's a ten pounder. So a ten pounder, he can feed 12, 15 people. Sometimes you got three ten pounders. Sometimes you got a net so full that you begin to just throw back some you don't need, and you you, you can end up with a hundred pounds of dressed catfish in the in the, in, the, in the, within an hour. I just go yeah. get them, come just like I'm I'm just going over there. I'm not guessing; it's the spot for the Opelousas. I found well, that it. Was, that was quite so. I've got a question. So so because I because we've got some yeah we got some guests coming. We got a, one of our good friends going to be on the podcast next week, and we're going to feed him after he's on the podcast. And so because um, so I, I wanted to feed him some Opelousas catfish if we could get some. But my question is that you know you've had some back issues. I, I don't want to throw you out for future podcasts, so are you healthy enough for this maneuver? Because you're making me really nervous. Dan talked up, muscle up, this and that and the other, working 
he's a, I use him for heavy lifting. Well, when I okay, started, so you got a muscle man. But yep. Yeah, so I got the muscle yeah. man there. I'm just letting the boat idle there while he's, and so I'm gonna let him get up, get up the fish. So, so Dan's your muscle man. He's a You're muscle just gonna man. be the overseer. You're we gonna be used telling to him. run 100 nets when I was fishing for Back a in living. The day. Now we have okay. this many. Just that one. Just that yeah. one net. Okay. And it supplies okay. us for all spring, all of the month, about half the month of April, all of May going into June. Now, if you leave them there in June, the ops will begin to diminish. And at blue catfish, blue fi- blue, blues, they, they will mm-hmm. start be it, making their journey after the Opelousas. Opelousas. May's the month to get them. And I seem to recall a one story where it became full of uh, some kind, maybe needle nose gar or something else, and that 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 turned tragic. That has happened before. Yeah, I heard about that because they they die, and then you got a mess on your hand. Oh yeah, well, I that, heard about that. That means story your too. net is too shallow. Too shallow. Yeah. Get deeper, yeah. you there, you won't have that problem. So Phil's right. the The depth at which the net lays depends on what kind of fish. Yeah, that you're going to catch. Yeah, blue cat run a little deeper than the ops, so you got to find the highway, the op highway, is what we call it, and then you have found. There's something down on the bottoms, the way the current is, that these fish, when you put that net right there, they're going to be in the net. You're go, you're going to catch them. It, it's it, you you fish it enough, you know where they run. That it's a run, like an interstate highway. Yeah, it's like X-ray vision without seeing. See, this goes perfectly with our study. Even though you don't see the highway and the travel lanes, yep. what's coming out of the water, because you know how deep it is by how long it takes the net That's right. to hit the bottom. So even though you don't see it, you know they're there, Al. Right <laughs> now, it's about 10 or 12 feet. I'd say 12, 12 feet foot from the top of the river to the bottom on the on, on the, the bottom of the river it's about 12 feet deep right here well it was it got down you know you know it got down about seven or eight foot but now the river's r- risen about 10 10 clicks so 10 feet it's risen <laughs> 10 feet so i've got to adjust that but if you want off loose catfish i'm your man Oh, I thought I you do were fixing to wanna... invite the uh, unashamed nation to the said. No. I thought maybe if you've gone too far with the take the two fish <laughs> and the five loaves and let's feed the thousands. What is sad <laughs> about the whole thing is that the Opelousas catfish is not even known to be a catfish in most circles. Most yeah. people, you say, well, what are you catching? You say, well, ops, we're catching yellow cat. Flatheads, they got different names, but you say they're all Opelousas catfish. They have a their their skin is like an Opelousas horse. You see that yep. splotchy, splotchy. Well, it's it's a catfish that looks like that. But if you, know you catch uh, him and his belly meat is th- this thick, I mean that thick, and I can just you can take his belly about, meat off. For those of you listening, that was about two inches thick. That oh, was showing yeah. two inches so, thick, you know, and you he's said, uh, his meat. It's a cleaner look, no doubt. Than Very the white. blue cat, or what's fascinating to me is the blue cat. They all look the same. Now there's different versions of them. Three or four different kinds. Yeah, well, I think there's way more than that. But I mean that we catch. We have the we call them chuckle heads. Yeah. Uh, humpbacks. Humpback, humpback blues, or the uh, the ones that channel are kind of have the yeah channel cat or yellow with the little black yep. dots on them. Eel cat we call them some of them because they're the color of a fish eel, which is kind of a light yellow. That's the one they got that made the fishing. They stocked the ponds. Yeah, that, that's the fish they got that that eel cat. But he, the opalus doesn't grow to be a great size. He he's not big, he's much bigger well, my, than that. My point was the blues, whatever kind of blue cat they are they all look the same the op they all look different they're all yeah. a little different some yeah. of them are lighter and, i mean they're all the same yet there's right. not two of them alike which is kind of fascinating he's a master of camo but he's the best eating catfish in the world that's it yeah some of them are super dark you saw some, some in the sea light. of galilee didn't you oh sea of galilee was loaded that's why so 
I was going to ask you that. So here's a boy with with two small fish. What would you say on a scale? What constitutes a small fish? I'm I'm thinking they're they're talking probably about one pounder. Yeah, small fish, about a pound. It's a little skinny, little one pounder. So feeding five thousand families with a couple one pound fish. That's a lot of stripping mm. hide off and, and <laughs> scaling them or have you gonna dress them. But I'd like to talk to the ones, Peter and them, that, that caught them and dressed them. I'd like to see them how they did one about that. No, there was no because after we get done no with dressing. the Appalachians, there's there was no, no bones. dressing. Yeah, but he he just was so they I guess they cleaned the two fish and then somewhere in there it just kept it the here's the way I imagine it. So he's he's sitting there, and he's just and then they're gathered around him, and he's just blessing food, and he's handing it to them, and they're taking it out. So it's just appearing where he's at. So when they talked about gathering it up, it wasn't like they were. We're thinking like our grandkids and kids, like there's food left everywhere, and they go around gathering up. That ain't the way it worked in the first century. Nobody had leftovers, you know, like they just wouldn't eat their food. The leftovers from where it was where Jesus was piling it all up as he's passing it out. He's just sitting there and the food is being created where he was. Yeah. So, whoever, you know, whoever dressed them, somebody dressed them. The two? They had to get the guts out. Well, well there were only two fish and he fed 5,000 families. Yeah. But the five, so there was no dressing the 5,000 fish. He dressed the well, two. But they didn't eat them raw, did they? Well, it doesn't say. I would think didn't say they cooked them, but he built a fire in John twenty one. So if he's cooking them post resurrection, I'm sure he probably cooked them pre resurrection. But they had fish. They had fish that they could eat raw. So I don't know. That's a good. I question. I had some sardines last night. So yeah, I mean, but but they had those kind of raw? fish. But they had olive oil. I mean, it's yeah. raw, but it's it's sealed in olive oil. You know, it's funny. All the times we've talked about this text, we never talked about whether they cooked them or not. Well, I would think whoever, and I guess it was the Almighty, when it came time for him to perform a a great miracle, would be to have a a boatload of fish, and you either, you got a big enough fire to, it's just running across that fire a little bit to, to their they're well done or whatever. I don't know whether these were baked fish. I don't know whether he baked them to eat them or whether he fried them. Well, I know this. But they could have eaten them raw. Well, but, they didn't fry them. but the main reason they all followed him around, because we learned that, this will be a good review, is not because he did the miracle, but it says because he fed them those fish and bread. So evidently, it was spectacular, which means I think it had to be cooked. I mean, who's going to follow oh, no doubt. a guy around for some sardines? Well, it's like, I, mean, I, I, like got, a, I got an old saying, Jace. <laughs> I like my fish fried. I've never heard that. I can, heard you that. can hold up once and say, Lord, what about this? And, you know, I like mine fried. What can we? He said, well, we get a little olive oil. We'll cook that for you. So, Jace, we're just glad your technology's working and that you're hanging in there with us today. Oh, yeah. Well, this is here's the funny part. So, Mom, Miss Kay, Phil's wife, is with us. And so I got to see how the sausage was made on getting Phil the information about what time the podcast would be. And what I concluded was, is they're one step below smoke signals. <laughs> they have neighbors going down and telling <laughs> Phil, which led to a funny thought of maybe Phil and Kay doing another movie, and the name of it would be Tech No. <laughs> and you just show all these instances where technology passed them by, cell phones, computers, uh, Wi-Fi, mobile phones. <laughs> well, it is it is kind of amazing that uh, that as technologically challenged as Dad is, that one of our longest uh, running sponsors is a company called Patriot Mobile. But I think one of the reasons why they've stuck with us so long is not the idea of uh, phones, but is because they are Christian conservatives, Dad. So their values line up very much with you and with us. They're the only Christian conservative wireless provider. 
They offer dependable nationwide coverage on all three major networks, so you can get the best possible coverage in your area, but you don't have to necessarily support some of these liberal outfits, so that's what we love about them. They offer a coverage guarantee, so if you're not happy with your coverage, you can switch to a different network for free without changing carriers. All this, plus the knowledge you're supporting free speech, the sanctity of life, Second Amendment, and our military and first responder heroes, so we love that. Uh, they have a great uh, customer service. They make switching easy. You can go to patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them right now at 878-PATRIOT. You get free activation today with the offer code Phil. So let's stand together, support companies that share our values. Patriotmobile.com slash Phil, or you can call them at 878-PATRIOT. Check them out. Yeah, I don't know that they they had the means, but I don't know. Who is that, knows? Is I that mean, t-shirt worthy? I like my fish fried. Fish well, you're going fried. to cook them. These, these things, well, I think. I don't know. Sushi's a pretty big market these days. Sushi's big. I love they, me some sushi. The, by the time they get finished with it, I'm not even sure what I'm eating anymore. There's all kind of stuff they got, you know. Oh, yeah. The, uh, on the sushi. It's like a sardine. Now, that's why I was bringing that up. Now, what you could do is visit some people. If they still are fishermen around there on some of those waters over the Middle East. You can fish there. They said you can. Yeah, fish. yeah. You could talk to some people around there. Nobody fishes. And they could they, they would tell you how they were prepared on the cleaning, the dressing, and the cooking. But I would well, think Jesus wouldn't have given fed 5,000 people of raw fish. I just don't think he would have done no, it. That's why I said it. No, I, I think he. Of course, one, one, touch of the, one touch of the finger. And it's fried, baked, or whatever else you want. That's what I'm saying. We talked about the heat and the light at first. I like mine fried. It's uh, calm down. <laughs> They're all fried. This is the first microwave right first there. First microwave. Mr. Microwave was on the bank. Yeah, that's true. I never, microwave I never thought is, about is that. a person. I am the microwave. That's right. I am the microwave. How are we going to cook this? You bet you. Well, we got another. How do you item. like your fish? Because you'll speak up. And the ones that said, well, I think we'll try mine. I like our mine baked. Baked, okay. Hey, get, let's bake some down the way there. I actually reached out to uh, <laughs> to Dallas Jiggins last night about the, uh, I said, look, I brought up this so-called controversy over I am the law of Moses. I said, I went to bat for you because whoever came up with that line, kudos to him. Yeah. So he gave me the impression that he came up with it. So, but I was like, "Good job." But he was he was appreciative of our support because I was like, "Don't worry about these, you know, seventeen people who have missed the grace of God and the power of what Jesus represents." Who are you tell him it prompted a whole uh, "I am" uh, study on our well, podcast? I said, I said we were actually already doing the study. That's how I yeah we were ran across it, but yeah. No, it was a good conversation, but uh, he's like, "Oh no, we're not worried. We just, we just, we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep sharing Jesus." And so that's what good. you have to do. Nope. I'm you glad you have to discouraged. let this inspire you. And to kind of wrap up our review, you got to ask yourself: Will your loaves and fishes do it for you? You know, here's the we had said he had his lunch. <clears throat> And that's always a choice you have. Is that going to do it for you? Or do you need, because there's a picture here that, that Jesus is, is creating. It, it's not going to do it for you. That's why you need God's power. And, and there's an underlying, when, you, when Jesus enters the arena, these are the things that, that can happen. And he's showing yeah. you that he controls the atoms and the molecules. He's planting the seed in your mind that God sustains us, but God also can resurrect us. I mean, all these things point to where we're going with this. But when he says, "I am the life and the resurrection," I mean, when yeah. you're when you're feeding thousands of people from two small fish and five barley loaves, there they, you gotta you gotta stop. And say, are you well, gonna? Jace, you've you've seen out of our household. There's something to be said about if you just counted the numbers of people that's eaten at our table. Now, you were raised down here on the river. You're up a ways a little bit now up in the subdivision. But while you were a boy coming up, 
How many f- fish fries, fish feeds would you say we had? Many. Hundreds, if not a few thousand. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I've been so out So the on... volume, if you stacked up the volume of fish in our kitchen, it wouldn't hold them. The fish that's been eaten yeah. out of that kitchen. So, but you weren't getting it out of the thin preparation air. for food here. You know, why go into really minute details? But they probably were cooked, and other than just having a line of people, well, they were cooked by the finger of, of yeah. the Son of God. So, we could have made that, that that easy for you, whatever you. What I'm trying to say is, he didn't have a cooker or a fire, it just he was just making it, a, he was yeah. making it rain, boy. But I will say this, is it is interesting. But yeah. it is interesting because we started out this thing by way of review, Jays, by talking about I am the light of the world, which was the John eight, twelve and John nine five, which talked about the light that changes lives. And so, Dads, your life was changed. You moved down to the river because th- I never thought about this till you we started this conversation. And you put that rope out there. 50 years ago, when you became a son of the Almighty God, that's when that rope went out there, by the yep, way. that's when it went in out. In that spot. And so most people don't have a rope, and they know where it is and nobody else does, where they can go out and catch fish to feed people, usually for spiritual purposes. Because when I asked you about this, can you catch some fish to feed some people, is to be on this podcast and to, and to help with this book that we're writing to lead people to Jesus. So what I'm saying is it's not the same as Jesus, but it is a secondary purpose to do his will while we're on this earth. So in some ways it's not the same as him, but it is secondary to what he's called us to do. But And uh, and if somebody walks up and they ask Jace, they said, look, you know, I don't want to be mean about it, but Jace, your, your dad, you you think he can catch y'all? You can y'all catch enough fish to, we got 25 people coming. You, know, you think you can catch enough for 25? And my answer, what, what would my answer be, Jason? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you I'm saying. Well, so are you sure you can catch that many fish to feed 25 or 30? I said, no doubt about it. Well, you have the set. You're, that's why I brought up faith. You're sure of what I'm just a follower of Jesus, and I'm saying and I can get, I got You're to certain of what you do not see, which is the highways under the water, and they're going to travel that highway. You put the net there, and they say there's no guarantees in life, but you can make it pretty, you, pretty confidently say, if you give me a little time, Oh, it's gonna happen. That's right. Give me, <laughs> give me ten days. Now, in Jesus's case, uh, I liked what you said because he it saved us a lot of work. And uh, there's an underlying principle here: when you realize that you don't have enough to offer, that's when your heart's getting ready to surrender to Jesus. Because it's it's always like that. He, he you can't you're not going to be able to earn your your merit or your salvation or so. He he intervenes, uh, especially in something as as simple as that. I mean, that's why you know when he's teaching. Hospitality them how- means the dis- dispense uh, of food. You, you bring the people that are they're there something to eat, and as as neighbors go or or as living out practice hospitality, there's work involved in hospitality. And providing yeah. it. I mean, it's yeah. not something that you would just willy nilly go out there. I mean, you got to catch the fish. <clears throat> you have to know enough to know how to catch them because you got a feed coming up and 30, 30 people or 300 people are fixing to show up. I mean, we've had feeds down there to where, I mean, the parking lot the, under the trees in my yard, I mean, they went on up the highway. One time I invited my class, I'll feed the class. It's about 30 and 40 in there. Well, when we came to the day to, to fix the fish, I said, I better put some extra fish up because that 30 or 40 mushroomed into about 200. They yep. just started showing up because you got fried fish coming, and it's free. Well, they, <laughs> if, a, if you feed them, they will come. That's right. <laughs> I remember it. I remember it well. Oh, yeah. But, you know, if it fit that text, Dad, we remember we were in Second Peter – uh, remember in Second Peter when he talked about that's the lifestyle that follows 
when we looked to him, That's remember right. it was gr- it was a, a lifestyle of hospitality without grumbling. Yep. That's one of the that's one of the fruits you'll see. Plus, I don't hold it against anybody that says, "Well, I would hate to th- throw a big outdoor fish fry." Well, if you're in the business of catching fish and settle them to make a living, you can shave off enough. No matter how many people there is, you can shave right. off enough and have them ready. So, oh, we've done it before. Just ice chest after ice chest, big old ice chest. I mean, they're all iced down, ready to go. And you just start taking in there and frying them. I mean, cooking oil. I mean, we have, you know, we use peanut oil but, when we fry our fish. Well, Jesus viewed this as his work. You remember in John five seventeen when he said, my father's always at it at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Yeah. But when you think what he was doing, he was getting up every day and arguing with those who were under a system that they thought their work would save them. And he was saying, I'm the way out of here. I mean, that was the seed that he was planting. But it's interesting that he viewed it as, I mean, he's working. Well, who's he working for? He's working to get us. To heaven, to give us hope, yep. to give us, even showing in this situation, you're like, well, he didn't take any work for those those fish. Because it's weird. You kept saying, who cleaned the fish? I was like, the what? The, I don't think there was any cleaning. There was no process. He just, he just it was took just it instant. Did. The fish were just appearing at a literal thin I air. needed him a many, many days <laughs> going back over the last 50 years. If I'd have just had Jesus, then Lord... <laughs> there's there's about three hundred out here showed up and they they, they I, we didn't invite but fifty but there's five hundred what do you think I would have loved for him to step up and say get out of the way woo, woo, and just but but, uh, but think about it from his perspective how easy it is when you made fish to to create them when oh. you needed them so well and the overall <laughs> point was he was saying I am the fish I am the bread that he was yeah, that and was the whole his, thing that's the work part of it was was actually setting a scenario scenario up where he when i get to heaven one of the things i'm going to ask the lord is lord let's let's be honest here you and our father you spent a little more time on these avalusas than these other (laughs) catfish i mean they're just better i mean better a lot of people don't like uh, thinking about life insurance because they don't like thinking about death have you ever thought about that jay yeah uh my mom and I, we were traveling from the church yesterday to our house here south of Nashville, and there was this huge cemetery. And the question was asked, do you know how many people are dead there? And so Kay started trying to guess, and I would shake my head no, and she's like, well, what's the answer? And I said, all of them. (laughs) and she said what that's a dad joke (laughs) and so then i said i said okay people are dying to get out there and she still didn't get it and i said that's why people buy life insurance so that was the conversation well there you go (laughs) mom's always good to tell jokes to well one of our uh, sponsors is a group called policy genius and uh, what they do uh, is help you compare uh, life insurance policies so you can get the best price. And uh, they were built to modernize the life insurance industry through technology. And uh, with Policy Genius, you can find the life insurance policies that start at just $25 a month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. So we like that. They have licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. They have no added fees. Your personal details are kept private. And so they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash fill or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. PolicyGenius.com slash Phil. Check them out. Well, now you got a situation in Israel where this Sea of Galilee is teeming with Opelousas catfish. 
But most you mean people, you saw this? Phil, I saw it. But most people that are in Israel deem the catfish as non kosher to whatever rule that they're following. Ah. So nobody's catching them. <laughs> and they're just they're just sitting there. Man, that shows you how ignorant the people are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- he is th- if you talk to him, how, I tell you what you do. You start frying them over there on the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> and I'm telling you what, people will gather. Okay. Be the people and, who gather, or somebody's going to hit you in the head with well, a rock. Well, Jesus got so. it going back way back here, I tell you, but if you could pull it off right now, fry them ops, well, you wanna, they would come. You want to bring some persecution, that'll probably do it. Fry them ops so, and start doing Acts chapter 10, oh, that yeah. big sheet of heaven there that big sheet out of heaven right yep so where are we moving to next All right, so we're moving we're moving to john 10 oh, really? so we john did we, we did i am the light of the world now see look now, we, i'm i'm having to object at whoever because religious people like to make lists you know you, here's the seven ways to overcome anxiety you know five ways to have a happy marriage and well, and and the more I'm reading these, I am the seven I am's of Jesus. But there's actually nine that we know of. Well, well, here two of them are two verses apart because he says, Correct. "I'm the door," or "I'm the gate," the gate, and yep. I'm the good shepherd. Yep. You're agreeing with They're this? Both son? in the same context. Yeah. No. What? They're so what I'm saying context. is what I've concluded is that there's the list should be one. The, the more I'm reading along here, because if you if you had adequate I am statements for Jesus, you could come up with hundreds. Yep. Really, and justify yeah, them. A lot. You could do a lot. I mean, he, he, he was making the metaphors in that anything you do during a day's time, you wake up, well, there's a resurrection connection there. You eat, well, there's a I am the bread, I am the fish. Because you have to sustain. Daily you need sustenance. to be starving for yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, there's a picture he's giving. You need to go somewhere where you gotta you got to open a door. Or you want to go hunt this property where the gate's locked. Yep. We've all been there. Oh, yeah. You got to have, you got to know the man with the key. <laughs> or you, you're not getting in there. And if you do without the key, then you might get shot. Yep. We've all been there. Mm-hmm. So you, you see where I'm going with it. Every oh, yeah. situation. So I don't know. You know, I, I just think the seven IMs is too. Uh, that seems confining too, for you. It's too. It's too confining. Too, for me. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's, it's just a jumping off place. So we're just all right. Well, look, Alex, we're just that, doing that, IMs. I told you, you you won me over the first day we got into this. I said it's more than a metaphor. So that's that's we renamed okay. it. Because well, yeah. so we moved on. You just said it's a jumping off place, but bridges there you go. are jumping off places too. There you go. Because we're into we're into <laughs> the deep water now. Make sure who you're jumping off the bridge with. Now yeah, Jesus let's hold said, hand. I am the bridge. Hand. You know, yeah, okay, I may jump. Let's but, hold hands, Jason, jump in together. Well, see, here's what I'm saying. Here's my point. So just to bring this up, and you know, in John ten, because he says that let's just See the two places. When he said, I'm the gate, verse 9, who, whoever enters through me will be saved. There's just a good standalone verse. And then he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, then that implies that he became a sheep, a lamb. He's also known as the lamb. I am the lamb, right? Mm-hmm. So it, right. it, you have three inferences. Which actually, well, there's three inferences. And an, and an inference. You have. That's right. He's the gate. I mean, this all starts off saying in verse one, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Yep. You're like, what's he talking about? Yeah, and read that. Read all the way down to six because he, it's all he about, really sets It's all up. about access. Access. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. He owns the place. Mm-hmm. He created the place. What's all that racket? Storm? Oh, no, that's Dan. He's getting the nets ready. The watchman opens the gate 
for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So they know him. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech. So I guess that would be your metaphor reference, Al. Mm -hmm. But they did not understand what he was telling them. And to be honest, the first time I read this, I thought, what's he talking about? (laughs) Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. So he's he's acting like we're sheep, right? Humans. Now... He was talking to the Jews here. Now, later on, he also said, I have some other sheep not in this pen. So don't you think he's talking about Gentiles there? I think so. Yeah. One thing that's interesting is that when I read this again, you know, with us studying it for this particular discussion, because we had just gotten through uh, studying First and Second Peter, it, it struck me and I had never looked at it from through this lens before when I read this, because we had just been back talking about Genesis one. It, it it never struck me before about thinking about the garden. Whenever God first created Adam and Eve and, and humanity, that He had such a close relationship, and He's He has this walking. I mean, in other words, He created us, and so when before sin enters into this, you know, dynamic. It, it was so it was such a natural, easygoing relationship. And the person who didn't belong in that scenario was the evil one. But he was there. And so all of a sudden he his presence is there, but it's like he didn't belong. And his voice is there, but it, it didn't belong. But when they listened to him, it just everything went haywire. And so to me, like, even though he's talking specific, he doesn't mention the devil specifically in this context in John 10. I mean, his fingerprints are all over this idea about what happens when you have access into this concept of people. And so, I don't know, I had never really thought about the idea of the garden before when I read this context, but but I saw it because I guess because we just got through studying Peter. But it was just this idea of when you put this foreign presence in the, in, in with the sheep, I mean, it doesn't belong there. And, and so that, that idea, especially when you get to verse 10, which we hadn't read, but when you see this idea is that all that this foreign idea is there for is to harm and hurt, but the creator is there to do good. And so when you see that happen, you see, damage and destruction and and difficulty and so it's just like to me it's like so so simple and easy to see but it's man once the destruction starts it's hard to get away from it then and so i don't know it was just a clear picture to me once i kind of put that back to the idea from the very beginning yeah he's Uh, he's really not he in a way he's describing the way out but the way out is to come through him and and understand what the way in is (laughs) Right, exactly, (laughs) because he provided that, right? Exactly. This this makes people feel uncomfortable in the world because they're like, well, I'm going to go through another gate or another door. And I'm like, well, you're in the wrong pasture. Yep. And so I I think you'll see that because he, you know, to continue reading, he says, therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I'm the gate for the sheep, this verse 7. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have a life and have it to the full. Yeah, you, you, you let Satan rule your life and, and you'll be getting out, getting out, out, out from... from Yeah, you know, or the scoffer or yeah. the, uh, you know... Even even the evil one masquerades himself as a angels of righteousness, you know, Paul referred to. So he said, I'm the good shepherd. And then he says he lays down his life for the sheep, which is what's different than about Jesus than other religious leaders. That once again, he's not trying to come up with a theology by which, you know, you can make sense of the world and have 
righteousness on your own that can accomplish some kind of reward system in the afterlife. He's basically saying, Is he talking I'm, about I'm the-, the gate and I'm laying down my life for the sheep. It's based on what I'm doing. Is he including the Gentiles down there in verse? He's uh, getting there. We're getting there. Verse so, six, 16, so, yeah. I have other sheep that are not of the yeah. sheep pen. Yeah, we're getting there. Let me get yeah. there. So All verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. I mean, you're like, what's his point? Jesus is not a hired hand. This He is personally invested. This is to to take uh, Paul's analogy in Acts 17. You know, we're, we are God's offspring. That's basically what he's, just think of the claim he's making here. Yeah. I'm not a hired hand. I created you and I died for you so you could be saved. That's what he's saying. So verse 13, the man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. That That's what's really appealing about this is Jesus is making an argument on how intimate this relationship is. This is not a mechanical relationship or theological. It's personal. Yeah. I mean, this is personal. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just This is 15. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then he says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Which is God bringing people together. I think that is the Jew and the Gentile reference. Yep. Which means every human that's ever been, that is, and that ever will be. No matter where you were born, because the Bible classes that into Jew or Gentile, which you're either from Israel or you're not. But he is the shepherd of all. So they too will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Look, how many times has he said he's laid down his life? This is at least three. I think there's four references here. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. There's another one. I have authority to lay it down. Well, there it is again. And authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. I mean, it's a very powerful, personal. It reminds me of Psalm 23, probably the most known psalm out there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. But, you know, it's it's this is a personal the, – the fact that we've we've gone so far into making, making Christianity and following Jesus ritualistic after reading John 10 and Psalm 23 is quite incredible. It this, is. This, he's trying to make it way more personal than humans tend to make how they view Jesus. I mean, he's like, I know, I know you. And they know me. I mean, I know them by name. I mean, so it's like, you know, when you think, well, it's kind of, what, what's it? Some people, I think, feel like it's silly because he's acting like a shepherd and a sheep. And it's like a pet or, or but it, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. He is he's giving kid. you an analogy of danger and helplessness. That's what, that's why he's using the analogy. You take a bunch of sheep. Out there, which I, because when I was doing the research on this, it's not what you think. You know, when you hear the Luke 15 story and he says, Oh, if your man loses a sheep, does he not go out there? And and then we see, because we've watched so many movies, you know, here comes the man and the sheep is walking behind him. No, when they lost a sheep, they went when they found him, they tied him up because you can't hardly get a sheep to go where he doesn't want to go. And they'd put him on his shoulder. It was pretty kind of brutal, you know, and would carry the sheep back to the herd, you know, cut the string back off and say, all right, you're back. Stay with the herd next time. So that's a more accurate, you know, picture of that in that he's showing the helplessness and the stubbornness of said sheep. And here's the Lord who is our shepherd and he's protecting us. So why would, uh, after reading that, the, the 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 John had written down at these words about authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. He said, "What many of them said, 
He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Because he, he shows you the way, he is the way, but you say, well, they say, well, finally, there's a way out of here. I just, but I just, now I understand where the gate is. I think when he compared uh, him knowing us to the way the Father knows him and he knows the Father, they they thought that was blasphemous. Yep. They thought you're, it's just like we had in John 6. They started picking up rock. If you're if you're claiming to be God or the Son of God, that that people don't like that, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I I think one is now we're back to I am who I am. We like our own religious ways, we get set in our we think we know what's right, and you when you're coming, if Jesus is the Son of God, that means you're nothing. So I mean, as human, and I think that's his point. We are, we're help. He was comparing us to sheep here. It, it's little insulting if you're prideful and if you're proud of your righteous acts. I'm sure these, these religious leaders didn't like being called a bunch of sheep. No, you're exactly right. And I think that if you've noticed, the one thing that's consistent now, this is the you know, the fourth where well, actually sixth time we've talked about this, but every time we hit an I am statement, what happens? So they're ready to kill him, they they're ready to desert him, they're yep. ready to leave him. I mean, the one consistent thing about the I am statements are this guy's mad, he's crazy, he's but it's cause he's saying I am God on this earth. Now, one of the things I want to read, Jace, was the... Raving ma- mad is a pretty tough... Raving mad. <laughs> raving mad is a pretty tough uh, uh, accusation aimed yeah. at Jesus. He's raving right. mad. I mean, you say, wait a minute here. Y'all, I mean, they, they didn't get it, Al. No, they didn't. And for, and for several reasons. Peter put it this way. Remember back when we studied First Peter um, in, ver- in chapter 5, he said, um, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. So he uses the same imagery when he's talking about this at the end of his book and when the chief shepherd appears, so he's going to go back to the same idea that he heard Jesus talking about back in John, you receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So he saw Jesus as the shepherd. And then he goes on to say, young men in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. So he paints that same picture of submissiveness as the sheep. I did. And he says, humble yourselves in verse six but then it's interesting because to me, he paints that same picture of awareness and watchfulness because he says in verse eight, be self-controlled and alert your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So to me, if that's not a picture of this idea of the thief and the kill and destroy. So it's, to me, Peter takes that same Im- imagery from John 10 and applies it into his book as the idea of what the shepherd is there to do and protect. But the idea that the thief is there. And that's what his purpose is. And and you see the same thing in Acts chapter 20, whenever Paul is addressing the Ephesian elders into their role as shepherds, he said, you're going to have these wolves is the imagery he used instead of a lion as wolves. They're going to come in, they're going to attack, they're going to try to destroy the church, but your job is to protect because you're shepherds. And so I think you see that imagery all over the first century church. And I guess you'd see the same thing today. I mean, it's, it's still our role. And the idea is that shepherds protect the flock. Yeah, but, you know, even going back to Psalm 23, you know, when he said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I always think verse 5 is is kind of going with, with what you're saying. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And, you know, it's not like he's saying... I'm not going to just take you out of the world because God is calling us to represent him. I mean, to be ambassadors, to be vocal. You know, we just saw that in first and second Peter. 
But by doing that, we're, we're going to be persecuted, where people are going to attack just like they were attacking Jesus. I mean, nobody likes to be viewed on as a sheep. In fact, you see any movie where a group of people are viewed as sheep, they're like, we're going to rip you apart. It's an insult. Some were and, raving mad. Others, verse 21, said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Wait a minute here. So there was always this division well, right. on the ones who accept Jesus and the ones who say no. Because humility it. has to be that. Because you think of what, you know, when Isaiah, you remember in Isaiah 53 when he said, uh, we all like sheep have gone astray. Yep. You know, he was given this vision of Jesus being crucified for us. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then it says he was oppressed and afflicted. He didn't open his mouth. Uh, he was like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. So it's like this picture of being a sheep. And in and, and, and reality, Jesus became a sheep for us despite all this power. I mean, right before he... He died where we started this whole I am study. He was blowing a Roman detachment down with his power. I mean, he didn't have to do this. That's why he makes the point here in John 10. You, they didn't take it from him. He, he allowed it. He chose to do that because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. He laid on, you know. Uh, him, the iniquity yeah, of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He did it for us. And so uh, you, you can take that how you want, but at some point you have to humble yourself and realize to kind of go along with what we, where we started with the fish and the bread, we don't have a lot to offer. You know, our own righteousness, our own eternity, our own... We, we really don't. And so you have to acknowledge that. That's why that the Bible says no one is good but God. No right. one. We're just a bunch of sheep. You know, you don't... And then we're not dumb enough to think, you know, Jesus is making, I mean, we're not going to go, you know, I love my dogs, but am I going to go jump off a bridge for them? No. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, Jesus is making this thing because, what? Well, they're a dog. But that's why, you know, God created us with this, this purpose that he would come rescue and do something that seems crazy, that he would lay down his life for us but i'm glad he did and that's that's why he's the the gate i mean that that's why he's the door that's what's different than him and and everyone else so i mean i think we should maybe talk in the overtime about the problem with not acknowledging this is because everybody says well i think you should just in our culture especially just look down deep inside of yourself and you'll know what's right for yourself and no you won't you need other people's opinion, and God's opinion is ultimately the one that matters. And and my point is, it's like American Idol, I think, proved that. I was so shocked the first time I ever saw that show, you know, where they see I don't even know if the show's still going on, but these people would show up and try to win a singing competition who couldn't sing. <laughs> <laughs> but they had been told they could, and they, they believed their dream, and, and they wanted to do this, and... You said, what have they done? They had looked inside their self and thought, you know, I can do this. No, you can't. You no. can't. That's a horrible formula for success. You have to humble yourself and ask other people's opinion. And, you know, God's opinion is ultimately the one true one that matters. And so that's what we do in a spiritual way is we humble ourselves before the Lord and realize we ain't getting through that gate without him. You can't come up there and say, oh, look at me. I have the credential. Let me in. Just no, you're right. I'm, I'm, I have the, my own key and all this, you know. That's good that we need to talk about that. You're right, because that's where a lot of times the problems come in with how people view Christianity, too, is the exclusive nature of it that they have a problem with. So we'll talk about that. Uh, if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where we uh, talk about our overtime sessions as well as have access to everything Blaze has to offer. So uh, check it out, and um, we'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. 
And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.